Uh, and so they have nu nuclei that are generally located at the periphery of these large multinuclear fibers. So when you look at a cross section, these nuclei are often at the, the points of these polygons. And in, in longitudinal section, skeletal muscle often has a, a distinct banding pattern. These individual muscle fibers are surrounded by a connective tissue endomysium, and then these fibers are grouped into larger bundles or fascicles that are surrounded by perimysium. So there's perimysium right here, which often contains blood vessels. This is a special stain in a close-up view showing you this banding pattern, which is a result of the spatial arrangement of actin, myosin fibers within the muscle cells. If you look at an electron micrograph, you can see the individual sarcomeres, which are made up of the actin and myosin fibers. If you were to look at this in cross-section like this, you would see these large actin, sorry, the large myosin fibers surrounded by the smaller actin fibers. How does that top one, uh, the sarcomere, differ from the cardiac plate? Uh, if you were looked at uh, an electron micrograph cardiac muscle, the sarcomeres would look essentially identical. You probably wouldn't be able to distinguish them. Uh, if you take an entire muscle belly that's arranged in uh, fascicles, the entire muscle belly will be surrounded by an additional connective tissue layer called epimysium. So we've got endomysium, perimysium, and epimysium, various connective tissue layers around the muscle. Uh, some specialized cells within muscle are these satellite cells. These are peripheral cells located along the edges of these muscle fibers, and they are cells that are active during regeneration. So basically they're, they're dormant until there's injury, and then they begin to proliferate to form new myoblasts. How do we tell those apart from this the peripheral nucleus? Practice. The practice. Uh, yeah, they, they actually look like raised dots on the cell, whereas the muscle nuclei are beneath the cell membrane and they're kind of nondescript. Okay. So it's really big and noticeable call it a satellite cell. Uh, within muscles, we've got mechanoreceptors. These can be uh, neurotendinous or musculotendinous uh, spindles. Uh, the Golgi tendon uh, organs are the most common. Uh, they're sort of nondescript and a little challenging to identify. They've got a connective tissue capsule and then some specialized uh, structures within them. Uh, we also have neuromuscular junctions, uh, which uh, can show up very nicely. Uh, these are basically the, the motor end plates for the uh, uh, voluntary uh, <coughs> axons that innervate the muscle fibers. And of course, there that. Uh, Gap is bridged by neurotransmitter or acetylcholine uh, in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, here's a nice EM of one of these motor end plates showing you these synaptic vesicles between the neurotransmitter and the synaptic artery, blah, blah, blah. I'm running out of time. Um, T tubules are modifications of the cell membrane within the skeletal muscle, which are used uh, to help transmit the wave of depolarization deep into the fiber, because remember these multinucleate cells, they're really large, and so the T tubules help carry that impulse deep into the cell. They, you need to do that because deep inside the cell, you have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is modified into these terminal cisterni, which are calcium storage organs. And so as that wave of depolarization is transmitted to the terminal cisterni, that causes calcium to be released from the storage sites within the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. And that release of calcium in the cytoplasm is what triggers sliding filament movement and what results in contraction of the muscle. So without T tubules into terminal cisterni, you wouldn't have efficient muscle contraction. Smooth muscle is called smooth because it doesn't have actin and myosin arranged in sarcomeres. Instead, there's a random arrangement of uh, actin and myosin filaments. And because the fibers of the individual cells are so much smaller, they have a single central nucleus as opposed to small peripheral nuclei. And so you can see that in the longitudinal section and also in cross section. You can see these large central nuclei. Uh, there's also the similar arrangement, however, of the endomysium, perimysium, uh, and epimysium within the uh, muscle. So this would be perimysium out here, for instance, and the endomysium surrounding muscle fiber. In the case of cardiac muscle, 
the individual muscle cells are very highly branched. And so in section, it looks like there are cells of many different sizes. Occasionally, these cells will be binucleated, so you may see more than one nucleus within a cell. <clears throat> and there's also a fair amount of connective tissue, so there's not only endomysium, but there's a, quite a bit of perimysium surrounding these muscle fascicles. Uh, cardiac myocytes will also have their actin myosin rings and sarcomeres, not unlike what we saw in the skeletal muscle. To help facilitate the spread of impulses from one cardiac myocyte to the other, and the guarantee that cardiac myocytes act in unison as a sufficient, there are specialized cell junctions between these uh, cardiac myocytes, and these are known as interpolated discs. And when you look at them in histologic section, they can be either pale staining lines or darkly staining lines. And on EM, it looks like a whole row of cell junctions along kind of a a ripple or corrugated border. The heart uh, is modified to contain the, the heart contains mostly heart muscle, which is myocardium, but around the outside of this myocardium, there are some specialized layers of connective tissue. So lining the inside of the heart, we have endocardium, and on the outside of the heart, we have epicardium. They look the same. The bottom line is they are a simple squamous epithelium, uh, sorry, a mesothelium. It's supported by a basic membrane, and you can commonly see small blood vessels and nerves within that sub-epicardial or sub-endocardial uh, region. Within that sub-endocardial, epicardial area, you can very commonly see myocytes, which have been modified as conductive cells, and these are the Purkinje fibers. So while I wouldn't necessarily expect you to be able to identify an SA node, because it just looks like a jumble of so much stuff, the Purkinje fibers look a lot like cardiac myocytes, except they're very highly evacuated. They look like they've got fat in it. So if you see something that looks kind of like muscle, but it looks like it's got fat in it, it's probably a Purkinje fiber. And we've also got cardiac valves that are mostly just little thin layers of connective tissue supported, uh, surrounded by endothelium. And then we've got our nervous tissue. Uh, Nervous tissue, remember, neurons have a similar basic uh, body plan. They have a, a soma that surrounds the nucleus, that, with the dendrites that extend from it, and then a single axon of conduction pulses away from the uh, soma. Within the cytoplasm, you can very commonly see nissel substance, which is endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, you can also sometimes see uh, lipofusin or sometimes melanin within uh, the neuron cell bodies. Ganglia are specialized aggregates of neuron cell bodies that exist outside the central nervous system. Just remember, most neuron cell bodies live within the CNS. So ganglia are these little aggregates of neuron cell bodies outside the CNS. The, the uh, cell bodies look kind of like pink fried eggs, where you can see the nucleus very nicely. They're surrounded by a little white space and then often surrounding these neuron cell bodies are small numbers of these uh, basophilic nuclei. These represent satellite cells, and these satellite cells provide uh, structural and metabolic support to these neurons in their uh, exile within the ganglia. Uh, peripheral nerves can be kind of challenging to identify. Uh, what look like the, are the nuclei that you see in the peripheral nerves, remember, do not represent neuron nuclei, they represent the nuclei of Schwann cells, which are providing myelination to those peripheral nerves. And peripheral nerves also have various connective tissue layers surrounding them, just like you saw in muscles. So we have endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium. And I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to blow through this very quickly. Uh, remember, the difference in myelinated versus non-myelinated nerve. In non-myelinated nerves, we have a single Schwann cell surrounding many small peripheral neurons. So here we've got these big Schwann cells with their distinctive nuclei, and you can see several axons within each Schwann cell. In the case of myelinated neurons, however, we have a single Schwann cell that forms many cell layers, or many layers of cell membrane around a single axon, and then you'll get these uh, Schwann cells lining up like boxcars along the axon. So when you look at the, the cross-section of the nerve, you see these uh, 
large swan cells with their nuclei, there's many layers of cell membrane surrounding the individual axons. Where's the endoneurium on this? Is it around the endoneurium in this case would surround the swan cell and the axon itself. Okay. So that's actually endoneurium. Okay. And then we have our meninges, various cell layers. Uh, the dura has been stripped off here. Uh, this is the arachnoid layer, the subarachnoid space, and then the pia mater, remember, is actually glued to the surface of the brain. Um, we've got the choroid plexus, which secretes CSF. Uh, our our microglial cells that include things like oligodendrocytes that provide myelination within the CNS. The astrocytes, the most highly branched. Uh, the uh, uh, you know, neuroglial cells, the microglial cells, which are phagocytic, they're derived from the monocyte macrophage lineage. And then we've got the ependymal cells, which line the uh, ventricles of the brain and the central uh, canal and spinal cord. These are free from the ciliated. And then we've got the various parts of the uh, uh, CNS, the cortex, which is composed of, oops, sorry, of peripheral gray matter containing neuron cell bodies, and then central white matter, which contains myelinated axons. And you can see the neuron cell bodies within the gray matter versus the lack of neuron cell bodies within the white matter. And then the cerebellum, we have a very highly folded, a very specialized organization here where we still have central white matter of a medulla, but now the cortex looks different. The cortex is composed of an outer molecular layer, which is fairly non-cellular, and an inner granular layer, which is very highly cellular, separated by this thin layer of Purkinje cells, which are very large neurons that are specialized for coordination and equilibrium. And then we've got our spinal cord, which has uh, peripheral white matter, central gray matter, and then the, the white matter is going to be uh, axons, tracts, gray matter contains neuron cell bodies, central canal of the uh, Ependymal cells, can you see us at, et cetera, et cetera. I'm running out of time. That's it. Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, see you next time for the exam. Good luck.